When Nicholas C. Creed staked his claim, the Holy Moses Mine, that brought 10,000 people into town. Creed was the last big boom town. It was a super rough and tumble life. When you think of what the Wild West was, that was Creed. We have to remember our past. The celebration of mining history is alive and well here in Creed. This program was made possible by the History Colorado State Historical Fund. Supporting projects throughout the state to preserve, protect, and interpret Colorado's architectural and archaeological treasures. History Colorado State Historical Fund. Create the future, honor the past. With additional funding provided in memory of Deanna E. La Camera and members like you. With special thanks to the Denver Public Library, History Colorado, the Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media, and to these organizations. An honor to all the hours, days, and years that they gave working in the mines. We're proud of it. We don't know anything else. We're a bunch of miners. The Creed area was originally populated by the Ute tribe. They were not friendly to the settlers at the time, and so Wagon Wheel Gap, which is the entrance into Creed, is called Wagon Wheel Gap because there is legend that the Ute people would hang out up on the top of the cliffs and then shoot down on settlers. They would hang the wagon wheels up along the cliffs as a warning to other people who were coming through the area. In 1871, the Bruneau Treaty was signed with the Ute to be able to allow the white settlers to come through, and that was when prospecting was able to begin in earnest. When Ulysses S. Grant was the president to encourage the development of the America West, he said the federal government would buy up all the silver that was mined. And so silver mining took off. Nicholas C. Creed, his real name was William Harvey, and he joined the Army back in about the 1870s. I was up in North and South Dakota fighting Indians. While he was there, the love of his life married his brother, and that broke his heart. So he never went home again, changed his name to Nicholas C. Creed. After Creed finished with the Army, he made it down to Pueblo, Bent's Fort, which is where the majority of the prospectors and people came. He went up on Monarch Pass and made a pretty good stake there. And then he wandered over to Bonanza, but wasn't satisfied, so he went into Del Norte. Del Norte's one of the oldest towns down the San Luis Valley. And he was there two or three years, every summer, wandering up the Rio Grande prospecting. 
The story goes he was prospecting up the East Willow Canyon and struck a silver vein and said, Holy Moses, I found it! When Nicholas C. Creed staked his claim in 1890, then everybody started coming to Creed. What's really unique about this boom town is that it happened super quick. A lot of the boom towns in Colorado had a little bit more of a slow build. Here, it was because of the compounding of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act and the, when the railroad was completed to town, and then finding such rich veins in this area that in December of 1891, it just absolutely went nuts. There was like 200 people coming here a day in the dead of winter. As was common with boom towns, word of Nicholas Creed's discovery traveled quickly. Prospectors hoping to stake their own claims flocked to the area. One such prospector was Theodore Reininger. Theodore Reininger came into Del Norte one day, happened to walk into a butcher shop. Now when he walked into this butcher shop, there was two butchers, Eric von Budenbrock and Ralph Granger. Now evidently he struck up a conversation and asked for a grub steak. They discussed it briefly and grub staked Theodore with $125. Now, that was basically about a year's salary in 1891. Theodore had come on up to Creed and was here for the better part of a year, not having much luck. And he was down to his last $10. He decided it's time to quit. He went into one of the saloons in town, sat down with friends of his for breakfast. He told him, he said, you know what? I'm done with Creed. This is my last day. I'm down to my last $10. I'm going to get me a train ticket and I'm going to head back to Denver. He said, I'm going to go up one more time. And jokingly, as he walked out the door, he looked at everybody and he says, see y'all later. It's my last chance to strike it rich. Theodore Ranger come up from town prospecting. He tied his burrow up. At some point during the day, his burrow pulled loose from the willows. He knew that burrow meant money for him. So he had to find that burrow before he left on that train that same day. He followed the burrow higher and higher up the hill for a total of over 1,500 feet of elevation change before he caught the burrow. Now, whether it was anger, curiosity, or frustration, we don't know. Theodore walked over, he sat down by the rock where the burrow was standing and started hammering on that rock. And that's where he broke open the amethyst vein that reached the surface. He loaded the burrow up, went back to town, and he went in to see Nicholas Creed. Well, Nicholas assayed his material, and it turned out to be high silver content galena, or lead. Nicholas came up, and he helped Theodore stake the last chance mine. Nicholas staked the claim right below it, the amethyst mine. Mining camps began popping up with each new claim, and with them came miners, merchants, gamblers, and more. It's common in these mining camps to have little communities, little towns that pop up around each of the mines so that miners didn't have to travel far to work. There was 10,000 in the mining district. The mining district includes Bachelor and a bunch of other little satellite towns that popped up near mining sites. Some of these canyons are extremely narrow, and so in order to have the houses and the shops, they built the houses over the existing creeks, and those creeks eventually also had the outhouses over them, and so it was, I guess, at that point in time, a, a sanitary way of removing waste from the town. Naturally, the building started to go down the canyon, and that was what ended up being called Stringtown. Creed was actually located up East Willow Canyon. And then at the end of the valley, that's where it bloomed out and a lot of buildings started happening. That's what is now Creed proper. At the time, it was called Jimtown or Gintown or Amethyst. This is the original map of Creed Camp in the vicinity. Each one of these is a patented mining claim. You have one mining area on top of another and there were hundreds. 
1892, they decided, you know what, let's just move Creed from this northern area. We need to incorporate and become a town. And so what was Jimtown then became Creed. When it boomed, so many people came here because they knew the money would be here with the mines, with the merchants, with the uh, gamblers, with prostitutes, with everybody. So anybody that wanted to get in on it didn't have to be a miner. He just had to get here and he could get in on the money. When you think of what the Wild West was, that was Creed. Well, life was tough in Creed as it was in all the little mining camps around the state. 10,000 people here, they all come here to fleece everybody that they can. People credit it as being the wildest of all the boom towns. We had a lot of colorful characters. Bat Masterson, he used to hang out with Wyatt Earp and was very well known, kind of a, a crooked cop kind of type. They said that just his presence on the street can keep people in line. Bat Masterson ended up being the sheriff of Creed for two or three years. Poker Alice was a, a notorious gambler and was known for having a cigar hanging out of her mouth all the time. Soapy Smith, the con man, was big in Denver, but he came to Crete. People always carried all their money in those days with them in a wallet inside their coats, and people would come to town, and Soapy had his men out there giving them a free ticket to go get a haircut. Of course, he owned the barbers, too. Well, the barbers would be cutting their hair, and then he could feel and tell if their wallets were pretty thick, so that would let them know that this guy's got quite a bit of money. Well, he'd cut a V in the back of their hair. That way, when they went down the street, Soapy Smith's con man could see, oh, here's a guy that's got a thick wallet. We'll get him off in a shell game or a poker game or something to fleece him out of his money. Then, of course, one of the most famous ones is Bob Ford. He was the gentleman who killed Jesse James. And he actually came to Creed fairly early on in about February, but he got kicked out in April <laughs> because he and one of his buddies were going around and shooting street lights out. He came back on the 30th of May, started a saloon here with the dancehall girls. We had a major fire. There was a Y junction, and there was a building right at the Y where the fire started. And because everything was right next to each other, it all burned to the south. But business didn't stop. We had tents go up very next day, even when the ashes were still smoldering. Bob Ford was a notorious figure even at that time. He was very well known. People didn't like the dude at all. Bob Ford ended up getting shot in his temporary saloon just about four or five days after that fire. He was killed by a gentleman named Ed O'Kelly. Some people say that it was a revenge for Bob Ford killing Jesse James. Some people just say that the two of them had beef. Nobody really knows. They say he was shot through the jugular and almost took off his entire head. Almost the whole town came to just be photographed in front of his saloon after Bob Ford was shot and killed. As tough as life could be in town, things weren't any easier down inside the mines. There's a saying here, it's day all day in the daytime and there is no night in Creed. Because miners were working 12 hour shifts, so they would go in and it was daylight and they would come out and it was daylight. It was a hard life and a tough life and the immigrants that were coming in is looking for anything to make a living. It was a super rough and tumble life. These were incredibly hardy folks to be able to survive being in the Creed winter and working in the mines. Mining's hard work. You spend half your day, 12 hours underground in the dark. It's dangerous. There's dynamite and dust. Everything you had to do by hand, from skinning to cutting down trees. When you would go in and work on your claim, you have to create the adit, which is the opening to your mine, and then you've got to get that all out of there. Dynamite is a tool, and then once they get their opening and then they start making their way in, you're using a pickaxe and dynamite. And eventually you have to create a stope, and so you have to have a lot of timber because you have to support that area that you're going in. And then they'd have to muck it out. That's a mining term for shoveling. There was just this attitude of, we can do anything. We could just go to a mountain and say, this, this area is mine, and then pick up a rock, and this is mine, and then next thing you know, you're the, the richest guy in the state. Nicholas C. Creed found a single boulder up at the Amethyst Mine that weighed about a ton and, and assayed about 2,000 ounces of silver per ton. That's pay dirt. He was getting 
According to the books, about a thousand bucks a day put in his bank account in Pueblo. Folks were prosperous during the boom years, but changes coming from Washington would make Creed the last boom town in Colorado. When Grover Cleveland became our president, he put us on the gold standard, and that caused the price of silver to just plummet. Silver dropped from about a buck fourteen an ounce down to around sixty some cents an ounce. There was a mass exodus from most silver mining towns because it was an incredibly hard lifestyle, so it had to be worth it. Creed, just like the rest of them, dropped in population. Everybody moved on. They had to find somewhere else to go make a living. This area went from about 10,000 to about 400. I think the last passenger train was in the early 1900s that left Creed. That was a sad day, I think. Many of the little towns around the state basically folded clear up. The reason Creed hung on is because we had so much silver. Anyone that has been to Creed or knows anyone from Creed knows that Creed very much has a can-do, will-do attitude. And the folks in Creed were determined and they didn't want to leave. This is a beautiful canyon. It was still rich enough that it was worth it to continue mining it, but it just was not on the scale that it had been. During World War II, when our nation needed lead for ammo, Creed was able to step up to that challenge, started mining the lead out of the mines instead of the silver. In the 60s, mining did come back. They found an ore vein up here at the Commodores and then also in the Bulldog Mine, and that kept a lot of people working for a lot of time. When Homestake came in here in the 1960s, they hit the Bulldog mine up here and they had up to 2,000 ounce silver too. So we had another boom. And Creed went crazy for about 20 years and we shipped about $33 million worth of silver down the tracks every year with 130 employees from the Bulldog mine. Hunt Brothers tried to buy all the silver in the country and killed the price of silver and it dropped from about $49 an ounce in a three year period of time tore down about $3 an ounce. And one day everybody went to work at the Bulldog Mine and the bosses said, get your diggers and go find a job. This mine's closed. And it's been closed ever since. Ultimately, mining ceased in the Creed area in 1985. Ever resilient, the residents of Creed have come to adopt a tourism industry. But as visitors walk downtown or explore the surrounding country, it is clear that Creed continues to embrace its mining heritage. There's a saying, the past is the key to the present, and I think we can learn a lot from our past. We wouldn't be in these areas if that had never happened. Everybody tries to keep things basically the way they were. Change is inevitable, and you have to move on. But just keep the mining alive is our whole hope. The Creed Underground Mining Museum is a place that has preserved the mining history of this area. This space has meant a lot for everyone here. When the mining shut down in 1985, that's when they decided to build this, so the mining heritage never got lost. There was three paid miners. It took them 18 months to do the blasting. The volunteers that came, they helped move the muck out, store up the walls, and they just did it so they could say that they were part of it. That's what this community does. Folks that love history, especially the American Wild West history, when you drive the Bachelor Loop Tour, which is a self-guided auto tour that drives through the historic mining district, gives folks an appreciation of what was. Being able to drive up the canyon and see those mines is one of the most incredible views. Along the Bachelor Loop, Visitors even had the opportunity to experience what life was like underground for miners during the boom years and hear a unique story of preservation. After grub staking Theodore Reininger, Ralph Granger eventually became the sole owner of the Last Chance Mine. The claim would stay in his family until 1998 when Jack Morris came to town. My grandfather was a blaster in the coal mine. 
And I remember hearing the stories. I thought, you know what, this, that's not bad life. I, you know, I, I think I'd like to you know, play a part of that. Well, I never quite got into mining, but I got involved with mines. And eventually, my trucking company and my second business, photography, brought me here. I came out here the summer of 98 to take historical photographs. As I got here, I contacted the last Granger, Nancy Granger Shallot. Well, I went ahead and hiked up, photographed it, went back down, called Nancy. And I said, Nancy, I'm off the property. She said, how'd you like it? I said, I absolutely loved it. She said, you wanna buy it? I said, ma'am, right now I couldn't afford to buy it. And she says, well, let me ask you a question. What would you do with it if you could afford to buy it? I said, I'd love to see it preserved, restored, open to the public. This is the kind of place that should be enjoyed by everybody. And I said, and the future generations need to understand the mining and what people went through. At the end of that conversation, she said, Jack, I wanna talk this over with my son tonight. Call me back tomorrow. Well, I called her back the next day and she said, David and I like your ideas and we've decided we want you to have the mine. She said, we're gonna sell it to you for the assessed tax value. She said $2,900. And I said, ma'am, I don't want to offend you, but why would you do that? That makes no sense. She said, because your answer was right and the other guy was wrong. She said, well, three years ago, there was a guy who tried to buy it from me and I turned him down because I didn't like his answer. He said it had a million dollar view and he wanted to bulldoze it and build a house. Well, I bought the mine. I went ahead and started restoration that same summer. I've learned what it was like for the miners to live here because I lived here with nothing more than a bed and a cook stove from the 1890s. I've restored. There are others dedicated to preserving Creed's story, and there is an ongoing effort to clean up and restore this scenic area to its natural beauty. As a result of mining, our creeks ended up with high levels of cadmium, lead, and zinc, and the fish don't like that. In 1997, the Willow Creek Reclamation Committee was formed, and they were a stakeholder group that partnered with federal agencies. Up the East Willow Canyon, they moved the creek was running through a lot of tailings. They also put in some settling ponds. When the Willow Creek Reclamation Committee started, there were no fish. And in a 10 year time, the fish population came back. And so those folks are really proud. There is hope that mining will one day return to Creed. The memory of the boom days is on display all over this small mountain town. But over the 4th of July, Old friends and mining families gather in the arena in the center of town and bring that heritage to life. The Days of 92 is a celebrated and proud tradition.